I figured if I'm going to do this, I might as well just start. You know, that's Red Butler, <laughs> the guy on my left. Red Air, Red Butler. <laughs> Hello. Except it's not R-E-D, it's R-A-G-D-T. Correct. Is that the same thing as Red? As Red? Is, is Red Red? No. Oh. Now, Red is a, it, well, it's a famous name, of course. But I believe it comes from the English uh, diminutive of Reese. That's my having looked into my oh, past of my name. I don't know. It works. It's a good name. You know, it, it takes a scientist to look into things. You know, as I was talking about the alawai before the show began, and wow, you know, Rhett knows a lot about the alawai. It takes a scientist to, you know, be curious, ask questions. Yeah, and well, file that's part of the that. fun. Part of the fun of science is yeah. to be curious and to look at stuff and to maybe scratch beneath the surface. Yeah. Or Sometimes uh, question things. Uh, yeah. Questioning is good. That's what we do here. <laughs> not, not in science, but about right. science, you know. So, um, uh, Rhett, if you didn't know it, Rhett is the director of the HIGP, Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, which is a big thing at the university. We're going to talk about that today. Um, so this is our series called Research in Manoa. There's plenty of that going on at HIGP. And uh, we settled on a title just before the show, and the title is for this episode, <laughs> What is it? Nothing is simple. Nothing is simple. Nothing is simple. <laughs> okay. Except when you start thinking it's simple, then you better really take another look. Yeah. Because you can surprise yourself. But well, we're going to make it simple for you. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to simplify nothing is simple and see if we can actually, you know, mm, hit some basics. So the first basic is, how did you get to be director? And why can't I be director? And what do I have to do to be director? Where do I have to go to school? <laughs> <laughs> how do I be direct? How do I become director? Uh, you have to have the dean walk into your office and say, "I'm going to throw you a curveball here." And how would you want to be the interim director? <laughs> okay. Ooh, that's dangerous business. <laughs> <laughs> so our prior director, Pete McGinnis Mark, was stepping down after ten years, and they were looking for another director. And I've been involved in UH since '82, a long time. Although I've spent a lot of time in Washington D.C. doing work with the uh, Global Seismographic Network. But I came back here in the uh, oh, 2004 and had been doing work in the glo global network and consulting stuff and, and had an office at UH because I was been an adjunct geophysicist for a long time and uh, I have a lot of management experience. So all of a sudden this director position opened up and so Brian asked me if I would like to be interim director and I said, it's an interesting uh, gig. I'll try it out for a year. Your and, curiosity was driving you. Yeah, well it's an interesting, I mean, having been at HIGP since 82, I mean, although it was HIG back then, uh, yeah, I've always been interested, always. And so after sitting in the job and working with the faculty, and I didn't decide to just apply for the job. I waited for a long time, and uh, eventually I said, well, you know, it's a great group. I, I can work with them. It's clearly really interesting stuff if you're all... A, a, if you're all interested in uh, geophysics like I am as a geophysicist, and so I applied for the job, and luckily they picked me. So now I am the director. So uh, um, you probably had some credentials to go along with the request. Ah, uh, yeah. I, I went to I'm well, think tech. I'm a techer. I went to MIT and Caltech, so I have a technical background and uh, scientist, uh, geophysicist since oh the 70s, a long time. Um, was at the University of Colorado for a while. Came to a UH via one of the university professors here. Uh, George Sutton introduced me. He's a great guy. He's passed. And uh, after a couple years working as a geophysicist uh, in the 80s, I was asked to be the uh, program manager of this new global seismographic network. We had this network that was put in in the 60s, all nice analog stuff. Basically, plate tectonics and most of our understanding of earthquakes came out of that, but as it became obsolete, we had to upgrade the whole thing. So I became part of the group that led the effort to do this entire, put a network all around the planet. So I did that for about 25 years and spent time in Washington, D.C., and we put out in that time 100 and, 154 seismic stations, every place from the South Pole to the Amazon Basin. We put one on the seafloor uh, using an undersea telephone cable. Uh, great, great, great experience when you get to travel around the but world and work with everybody. That's the very heart of geophysics, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, well, seism if you're a seismologist like I am, you know, it's really the key thing to understanding the Earth. We can look at its gravity field, we can look at its magnetics, but if you really want to look into the planet, seismology is basically the only way you can do that. 
you, you can't drill more than about 10 kilometers deep. And so if you want to know what's inside the planet, you've got to use seismology, which is the science of earthquakes and uh, the structure of the Earth. Feeling the vibrations. Yeah. So I did that for a while, for 25 years, and then eventually left. Uh, I was working for a not-for-profit consortium that university was part of. And let me add that I uh, always came back to Hawaii. Even though I left to take this position, I only ever took a leave of absence. And so I would go and work in Washington, D.C., and then every summer, which, of course, you know why you would leave Washington, D.C. in the summer. It's just <laughs> terrible. I would come back to Hawaii, spend, you know, one month to three months doing research with the people here, and then go back to Washington and go continue building the global network. So, uh, I don't, you know, I've been basically involved in UH, well, since the 80s. Yeah. And, uh, and so, even though I had not been here full-time, I had a continuous framework to look at everything. And so becoming a director now, I know the history of practically the whole place and was part of it for a large part of it. So not hard to do now. What, 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 what's the difference? And gee, I have so many questions. What's the difference between geophysics and planetology? I know there's a big difference. One is here, one is there, for one thing. <laughs> but but why are they, why, what's the difference and why are they lumped up in the institute? Well, you know, recently, I mean, my own background, I've only been interested in the Earth myself. I mean, I was really focused geophysics, physics of the Earth. Uh, earth feet on the ground. Feet on the ground. This is where we all live. This is important stuff. We don't understand this. You know, we're trying to understand it. Uh, and I got involved, actually, on the planetary side of things prior to becoming the director because there's this uh, InSight mission to Mars, which is to put a seismometer on Mars. And I was asked by NASA to be uh, one of the reviewers and, and on the uh, board that oversees the project because I had managed Earth's global seismographic network. So presumably I know something about how to do some things like this. And so I got very interested in Mars. And uh, so it, the long and short of it is, well, it's great. You, know, you can apply things to the Earth to Mars. But you know, once you start working in that area, there's a whole range of planetary issues that aren't all that different than what we have on Earth. It, it's just that you've got to do everything in a, such a difficult fashion. I describe it as like, uh, you know, the, anything you do in the oceans is 10 times harder. It's 10 times more expensive. It takes 10 times as long as, uh, you name it, everything. Dangerous. It, dangerous. <laughs> and, but everything in space is at least 100 or more times. <laughs> and so, you know, yeah, it's really interesting stuff. And you, there's unique science, and it's really an application in many ways of just what we know on Earth, but we see things out in outer space that's, of course, different. And planetology, it's, I, I kind of define it as everything outside the sun, and basically as far as you can see planets. And of course, we have our own Institute for Astronomy that really focuses on stellar galactic levels. So we kind of have an interface together. It sounds like planetology is geophysics for other planets. Well, yeah, but we do more stuff. It's, it's geochemistry, cosmic, is, although I consider all of this in a certain sense parts of geophysics. Cosmetology? Cosmochemistry. Oh, I, 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 cosmetology. <laughs> I was going to tell you, my wife has a very good cosmetologist. <laughs> <laughs> this is out of, um, what was his name, Philip Penko. Right. Do you remember when right. he came and he made jokes about cosmetologists? Well, some people think seismology sounds like cosmetology. I've had that uh, before, so yeah, I appreciate that. Well, let's let's let's. Uh, so now, uh, HIGP with all of that, you know, right. from the Earth to to the planets. Yeah, planets, exoplanets, and exoplanets too. Yeah, I mean, uh, an exoplanet is outside the solar system. Right, something around uh, Alpha Centauri would be an exoplanet. That's a long way. Uh, actually, Alpha Centauri is pretty close compared to most of the Relatively. stars. Relatively. Yeah. <laughs> we had a kid on this show who found an exoplanet. Really? He discovered one. Iolani e Jr. Wow. discovered an exoplanet. Uh -huh. That's how I became familiar with exoplanets. Anyway, so HIGP is right there as you make that first turn opposite East West, East yeah. West Road. Yeah. I mean, off East West, West Road. And it's uh, right there near the engineering school, as I Yeah, it's that big building that's kind of looks like a big blue ice cube. Yes. It's, it's, and it's freezing inside, too. <laughs> this is probably, <laughs> with climate change, is probably a good thing. Well, we have all this fancy, really high-tech equipment, and you have to keep it cool. So sometimes you have to wear a jacket to right? work. Oh, yeah. That's great. This and is another good reason I have to, to walk study out. it. <laughs> yeah, every once in a while, you go walk outside and enjoy that nice 
humid tropical <laughs> air, then go back into our little uh, ice box. Perfect. <laughs> so, how big is a HIGV? I mean, can I mean GP? Can can, can you give us like you know a, a, a sort of a, a little walkthrough in terms of faculty right. and projects and so forth? Is it bigger, for example, than a bread box? Uh, well, there's a whole building called the H HIG building when they uh, established the place back in the, uh, well, 57. Uh, they actually built a whole building, which is a really old, funky building, but I still like it. I used to have an <laughs> office on the top floor. Beautiful view of Manoa Valley. Great. It's a really nice place. <laughs> now, HIGP is about 100 people, which is what I manage, and it's about uh, 50 of them are faculty, and we have affiliate faculty. We have 19 or so uh, graduate students that we support. They're part of the Department of Ge uh, Geology and Geophysics because that's the academic side of things and we're the research unit side of things. A uh, bunch of great staff people, uh, engineers. Uh, we have lots of undergraduates that we work in various ways mentoring them and involving them in our Hawaii space flight lab. And it, it's just, it's a, it's a very broad place. I mean, it's really focused on, you say, geophysics and things related to planets or, or, or material in space, m meteors and asteroids and, and all of that interesting stuff, and everything in between. So, uh, but we don't do everything. I mean, I try to focus uh, at least on the Pacific. It's a third of the planet. It kind of is a manageable size. <laughs> and we don't have a lot of competition, you know. I mean, we're definitely, I mean, Honolulu is the biggest city in the Pacific. We're the biggest university. Right. <laughs> all, all that it's is, a lot all of nice terms. I mean, there's some nice universities on the edges and such, but we're right in the middle of things. So, <clears throat> uh, what, I, what I guess I, I, I'd like to know is the relationship Mm -hmm. between HIGP and talking about the Department of Geology. That's right. not inside HIGP, that's outside. Yeah, and we're guys... all part of a school of ocean and earth science and technology. Very large, uh, well, school <laughs> in the university. Uh, very successful scientifically. Uh, I want to mention that in Nature, Nature Magazine, which is probably with science, which is a U.S. publication, Nature is British, the foremost scientific publications, our school, SOS, has been rated as the, in the, the top 15 in the world in earth science, That's in great. environmental science. And that puts us t ahead of Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Oxford. I mean, a lot of big name places are, are further down the list than we are. So we really have an incredible resource here in the islands that's focused on a wide range of science, from oceanography to geophysics to chemistry to water issues. You name it, Too and it's a microbial first ocean, art. microbial and ocean, Seymour, Seymour and Dave right? Carl, Dave and Carl in that group, yeah. Yeah. exactly. So we have an incredible group of people that are doing first-rate stuff, and part of the reason for me just becoming on here is to really carry that message forward that the university really is a fantastic place. It's highly respected around the world. It's got a great reputation, and sometimes, unfortunately, the university gets dissed a little bit in the news, and yet we really need to recognize what great things the university actually does. That's true. You know, when, when Think Tank first started, um, well, we, were, we, were, we, we discovered that <laughs> early on. We, this is early, early right. 2000s. And we found all these pockets of excellence mm -hmm. all around the university. But then, you know, what, what, I guess what happens is the media gets distracted with things that are really not, not important. Uh, and the public, of course, mm -hmm. because of the media, they get distracted, and the legislature gets distracted, and people forget what really goes on in Manoa. That's the problem. Well, part of it is we have to do better outreach. Here I am. Yeah, okay, <laughs> right. And on that note, we're going to take a short break. Sure. <laughs> okay. We're right going to come back and talk about some of your projects and okay. research projects, especially in size, size, seismology. 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 Okay. <laughs> That's Rhett Butler. He's the director of HIGP, the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, here on Research in Manoa. And we're saying nothing is simple, but maybe some things we'll find out are at least manageable. We'll be right back. Hi. I'm Ethan Allen. I host Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. And I do this because I care about science literacy in Hawaii. I want to spread the understanding science is a vital and interesting part of everyone's life. I want to make sure the broadest possible spectrum of people 
understand the beauty and the value of science and realize that science plays out each and every day of their lives. I want you to understand that science is fun. So we bring on to this show each week guests or scientists, from astronomers to zoologists, and we talk about what they do and how they do it. But most importantly, we talk about why you should care about their work, why you should see that their work has value and impact on your life. So I hope you'll join us Fridays, 1 p.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii. You can watch us via live stream. You can watch us uh, recorded on Olelo, and you can see us uh, each week. We hope you'll join us. Okay, we're back, we're live. We're here with Red Butler of HIGP. That's the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. And I think probably one of his favorite things is seismology. I'm um, a seismologist. Yeah. And, and we, you know what, you guys didn't know this, but I really have to explain that seismology <laughs> is a violation of the rule of I before, I before E except <laughs> after C. It's S-E-I. <laughs> It's so important to have a rich intellectual life, you know. By the way, if you want to improve your rich intellectual life, you can send us uh, uh, Twitter. We'll read it on the air. Uh, we'll, we'll ask uh, Doc, Dr. Butler to actually answer it, and we'll discuss it, okay? And we'll thank you, okay? If you want to do that, it's Think Tech HI. Think Tech HI is our Twitter handle, and we do care. So, uh, seismology all over the world. You're yeah. familiar with the whole thing, but I remember four or five years ago, right. there was some kind of tsunami warning, and we went to the, uh, I forget, the, the, the federal office that deals in such things in tsunamis. And tsunami Warning Center, PTWC. Yeah. That's out in, used to be Eva Beach, and now they moved to Port Island. That was it. Great group. And what are the Most of them from the University of Hawaii. Yes. So I they are, so. you know, we have populated our state with people <laughs> <laughs> educated and now doing the job of keeping us safe. It's another another element of making Hawaii the center of this science, yeah. of SOEST science, including all branches, yeah, especially exactly. this one. So uh, what we found in there was that um, there, you know there were all these issues about uh, can we can we determine if the tsunami is coming faster, sooner, more accurately, blah blah blah, and and we got into the whole thing about mm -hmm. uh, where where the sensors were. And right. the sensors were, as I recall, on, on sea buoys. Yes. You're uh, talking about the DART buoy system, which is yes. the uh, DART, some acronym, but basically a pressure gauge is sitting on the bottom of the ocean. The tsunami goes over it. You can see the pressure variation. They tele telemeter that. They model it, and then they say, gee, there really is a tsunami. But it's all triggered in some sense by the fact that they can locate the earthquake much more quickly than they can see the tsunami wave. Because even though the tsunami is traveling like the speed of a jet plane, it's relatively slow. Jets take a long time, as you know, to get on to fly to Hawaii. So we have about five hours from the Aleutians, which is our closest point. Actually, a little bit less, four and a half. And so it's very important that we monitor that stuff very quickly because you don't have a lot of time. Yeah. So uh, yes, our DART network uh, around the Pacific, which was largely put in, because of the 2004 event, the great uh, Indian Ocean tsunami, where they did not have much warning whatsoever, it was decided that we should have not only seismic information about earthquakes, but also measure the actual tsunami itself as it went past these buoys. The, the challenge is, and it's a great system, and they were really valuable, but the challenge, of course, is keeping these things operating. Easy to put things in, Hard to operate and maintain. The old story. Nasty weather up there in the winter time takes the boys out, and then they sit there and they don't work until uh, sometimes June or July. They go up every every summer and fix them. So one of the challenges we have in Hawaii is just keeping that defense line operational, such that, I mean, if a earthquake happens that's phenomenogenic, that we see evidence for that. Now, if those boys are out. Unlike other parts of the Pacific, there were no islands between us. So when we had Tohoku happening, we got to see it hit uh, Wake and Midway, and right down the chain. You got all these measurements, so you could really tell how well your knowledge of that tsunami was as it was unfolding. Uh, and the same even from Chile. You have the Marquesas, you have other islands out there. But from the uh, Lucians, if that uh, warning line is not working, well, there's no... There's nothing to measure anything until you get to Hawaii, so it's pretty important. 
Well, it's, it's important on a number of levels. Would you agree with me that, in, at least in the span of your career, mm -hmm. what you do as a scientist in this area, trying to find out earthquakes and tsunamis right. and you know, disruptions, kind of call it uh, you know, geological disrupt, disruptions, my term, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, has become more important because you can save lives. Uh, oh, yeah. And that your relationship with the, call it the civilian community uh, is much tighter than it used to be because they need you and you want to do, you know, to, to help them. It's oh, part of your job. Oh, exactly. You know, I think that, uh, I mean, in my career now, that's what I focus on is, is uh, science, basically, but is it serves society. I think when you're younger, it's fun to do all kinds of science for, on whatever thing, creative aspects. But, and I still do stuff like that, but I really think now, after a long career being more or less a pure scientist, you focus it, how can you help people? How can your science or how can you make an effect that, that potentially saves lives, helps people, reduces disasters, points out obvious problems? It's, it's kind of, yeah, it's very much applied. And in some sense, that's what HIGP, what its mission is. We're uh, chartered under the state to provide geophysical advice, planetary advice. Uh, we're doing the planetary stuff with a lot of different things, and we're actually involved in having a... Uh, a rocket launch from Kauai to put up our own satellite, the first university that's that. ever done this. So yeah. uh, that will be coming up in the fall. Uh, but, you know, I've been involved in trying to advise the state regarding, gee, do we have the right tsunami inundation zones? In other words, after Tohoku, where the, perhaps some of the smartest people in the world in Japan got it wrong, you start to wonder, well, how good a job have we done? And they've come to the conclusion that the zones could should probably be bigger if you had a really nasty event up in the Aleutians. And so you want to just make sure that people are aware that, hey, we can't say to predict or forecast these things exactly, but we can look at probable effect and, and we can test that because we can model the Tohoku event in 2011, we can model the, that Chile event in 2010. We have a pretty good idea how to model all of this stuff. and so. Once you know how big an earthquake you can get, you can get a pretty good idea on how big a tsunami and how much inundation. And then you can look at your inundation zones and say, hey, do they fit? And so now that state, and, and the state's quite advanced on this because I think we're further along than all the other states around the Pacific that have really taken this up this charge to say, well, let's really look at what these zones are and update things to make sure that we're current with our state of knowledge. And so. It's been pretty, pretty nice that the state and the city have really been very you know, t taken the lead on this. Well, I think they, they see you as uh, the biggest source of assistance. Well, we try to help. Yeah. And, um, and you know, that, that feeling of isolation, there's nobody else around. I mean, we're so on our we, own. we have to have a relationship <laughs> <That's> here. <exciting. laughs> you know, we had, a, we had Carl Kim and the National Disaster oh, Preparedness yeah. Training Center on a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what... What, 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 what I learned, which we, you, you alluded to the same process, is this is like law because you're always looking at precedent. Precedent is part of the scientific examination here. You want to find out what happened before. You want to see what, what variables have right. changed. You want to feed all of that into a model and come up with some you know, reasonably accurate prediction. Yeah. And, and part of science is to question your model as well. So even though something may work for years and years, you can actually find out that it's wrong. And that forces you to recast your assumptions and then do more work to really come up with something better. So part of the scientific process is just not to quote find the answer, it's to really question whether this is still the answer now that we have more information. That's so very you exciting. To, you it? have to look at this stuff. It's, it's, it's not you get there and you're done. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah. You have to get there and it may be good enough for a long time. But at some point, you have to re-examine and say, hey, we can do better. And it's just like you know, we have so much technology on the planet now that we didn't have 20 years ago. Imagine that so things, conclusions we came to 20 years ago, we have to relook things now. Why? Oh, we have so much better technology to look at stuff. And because nothing is simple. That's right. Nothing <laughs> is simple. It would be simple if you know, you're just done. It's kind of like at the end of the uh, 1800s when people thought physics was over because they've measured everything down to the tiniest detail. Did they really feel that oh, way? Oh, yeah, and crazy. it was only a matter of extending a decimal place further. And then, of course, relativity, quantum mechanics came along. Everything was thrown out. 
Although Newtonian mechanics still works, now there are, we recognize it has its limits. The word physics in geophysics, what, mm -hmm. what does that mean? Is that like regular physics? or? It, oh, it's the same, yeah. It's, the, it's physics. So, it's, 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 geophysics is physics of the Earth. I mean, when I, was, when I was at MIT, I didn't particularly care for quantum mechanics, just one of my choices, and I like classical mechanics. So, by doing geophysics, you don't really have to worry about quantum mechanical effects. The Earth is really big, so I, I liked it in that fashion. <laughs> Although I have, you know, a, a side interest in quantum mechanics, I'm not really a practitioner. <laughs> let's uh, let's take one minute um, for a break, and we come right back. We'll talk about some of the specific research projects that you're working on, um, and uh, how how we can try to understand exactly what the what the tools are, the process is mm -hmm. the. Uh, in the science fair, they call it the, um, what is it, the, 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 the postulate, the, uh, the, uh, the idea you're trying to prove or disprove. Right. Yeah. Okay, um, that's Rhett Butler, a director of HIGP, the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology at UH, part of SOWEST, uh, and uh, we're talking about research in Manoa, all kinds, and nothing is simple. We're learning that. We knew that, but we're learning it again. <laughs> Even the statement. We'll be right back. <laughs> Even the statement is a tautology. Ted Ralston, folks, host of our show at Think Tech Hawaii, called Where the Road Leads, where we talk about technology influencing the future of Hawaii. Technology, of course, is the art of solving problems. We always bring in interesting and informed guests who can see from different perspectives and different points of view how that future might unfold and how technology can assist us in getting there. So once again, join us 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock on Fridays. Uh, Ted Ralston, your host. And please, if you have ideas that you'd like us to address on this show or folks who you think should be on it, let us know. Hi, I'm Chris Letham, and I'd like to invite you to come and watch my show every Wednesday at 3. I'm interested in a variety of issues that have to do with politics and our local business economy. And I'd like to bring on guests who like to talk about everything from technology to social media, to what we can be doing to improve our environment. And so I'd like to invite you every Wednesday at 3 to stay and watch my show here with Think Tech Hawaii. And I'll see you there. OK, we're back. We're live. We're here with Rhett Butler of the HIGP, the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics, learning about geo and physics and planetology. <clears throat> this is great. I wish we had more time. We'll do it again. Okay? Sure. We'll do it again. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> jumping to some, some projects, you know, because it's, it's like for this discussion, it's like a case study. So right. give us a case of research, uh, whatever pleases you to talk about. Well, one thing I've been interested in since I became director is the classic problem of bog, you know, the volcanic haze that we get here on Oahu. I live out past Kahala up on one of the hillsides, uh, out of the tsunami zone, by the way. <laughs> and, uh, but there are times, you know, you drive down the hill, you can hardly see Diamond Head. And you wonder, at least I wonder, well, what the heck is all this stuff? And you look at our uh, state uh, multi-hazard disaster plan, and it has a number of pages on bog. And you look at it, and everybody recognizes it, but we don't quite know what it is. Now, we all know that it comes from Kilauea, OK? And uh, a few years ago, Kilauea started really outgassing in about 08, and, and it got worse. And now it's kind of abated. It's going back down a little bit. But really, the whole process of exactly what VOG is is not entirely well understood. And so we do know that sulfur dioxide comes out of the vent, okay? And over time, in interacting with the atmosphere and the sun, uh, it changes from a, a uh, sulfur dioxide into uh, a, a, a aerosol, which, which then reacts with uh, H2O, water. And it, it's basically uh, sulfur, it's basically hydrous sulfic acid. This is not, this is not good. Yeah, so it's an, it's an acid and then it blows all the way over here and it's sulfuric acid and it uh, then potentially affects people here but are there other things in the VOG? In other words, is it simply that? Is that it? Or are there other gases and parts of the chemistry? So it, just because in part, although it's a recognized problem and it's a problem here on Oahu where there's, gee, nearly a million people uh, it just strikes me that one of the things we can do is to look at that problem more. And so we have a number of excellent scientists uh, at uh, UH, 
uh, Anupam Misra and Shiv Sharma, who are experts at uh, various laser techniques to, that can remotely look and man, a, analyze the chemistry or man, analyze the uh, particle size. Well, we can do these with lasers. And of course, you have to be careful with lasers. But we why? Can, why? Well, because the most important thing is uh, you don't want to look at a laser. Okay. I've done that once. I, I was in a, uh, I was in a uh, uh, meeting once on Okinawa, and there was some guy was talking, and he was, you know, people... Oh, it's just one of those directional... One of, the, one of these directional... Speaker lasers. One yeah. of these little la red lasers, and he flipped it around, and it hit me in the eye, and I about fell out of my chair. It was the brightest thing I have ever seen, so never do that. The damage? Injury? No, no damage. But it was, they could be. They could have been, but I'm just saying you have to be careful with lasers. Yeah, okay. So, you know, they're not toys. Okay. They're serious. Anyway, but you can use lasers to remotely look at stuff. And so we want to measure as the gas is coming right out of Kilauea exactly what's coming out and how it's changing. And then we want to monitor how it changes from a gas to this sulfate and then work with our Steve Bussinger and our Department of Meteorology and then bring it and map it over here to the island. And Steve is already doing that, but he's not doing it in the level of detail that we can do so now. And then we want to measure on this island what it is we're seeing. And so what, the, what does the air look like on a clear day as it gets boggy, or can we see what the, how that's manifesting itself? And, and then, once we have some clear data, then we can begin to look at things which, once again, our medical departments are looking at, you know, how yeah, it affects uh, people, how it affects people on the big island, how it affects crops. How does it affect well, demographic over here? basis? Yeah, I how mean, many people are going to be affected a, by this or that? I have a good friend, Eddie Cam, who has uh, emphysema, and boy, on a foggy day, he has to stay inside, turns on his air conditioning, really doesn't go out. So it it affects people. I know people that it affects. But you know what? I sorry. Um, I, I I left it on in the thought that uh, it would sound like we were really in an important place doing it. Important things. <laughs> <laughs> I turned mine off. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You know, climate change. Yeah. You know, SOEST and HIGP must be fascinated with climate change because it affects things. It's one of those variables you mentioned earlier that changes on you. Right. And you, you know, and you can't make the old assumptions. You have to build in new, new, new variables, new dynamics. Right. So query for uh, the fog. Right. If I have a higher temperature or different mechanics up there where, it, where the fog travels, is that going to change the composition of the fog? Well, you know, the VOG is, a, is chemistry turning into sulfates, which are little particles, and they come over here and then get in our lungs. And so, at least in my thinking, in the, yeah, the dynamics of the atmosphere will probably change in climate change, but the chemical process is probably not going to change that much, at least in terms of the VOG. That would be my off-the-cuff answer without really thinking a lot about it. Are you studying climate change? Uh, I'm not so much involved in climate change directly myself as a geophysicist, but I've been involved for a number of years now working with the UN on trying to put sensors on undersea telecommunications cables. And the reason to do that is most people don't realize that when we talk about climate change, almost all of our knowledge is only of the surface of the ocean and the top kilometer or two. There's almost zero information down deep. Most of the volume of the ocean, we do not sample whatsoever, okay? And so, yes, we know about the top of the ocean, but, you know, as is the bottom heating, or how does the effect of climate change change the pressure field? All of that stuff is unknown, basically. We have a few, we have a handful of little samples around the planet. So it's kind of entirely different than most people think that we're studying everything. Well, we really haven't got good knowledge. And, of course, all of the internet's carried under fiber optic cable into the oceans, trillions of gigabits. And there's nearly a million kilometers of cable already laid on the seafloor. Now, that's there. We're not going to change much. In the past, we've gotten the telephone companies to donate a few cables, and we've put out some seafloor observatories using those. But if you really want to make an impact, you want to include sensors in the cables as they lay them. So imagine about every 25 years, they have to replace everything. Why? Because the technology improves so much more. The old stuff is not worth running anymore. So they are continuously relaying cables, not only over the same routes, but over new routes. Now imagine if each one of these cables, and they have, you can't fire a laser all the way across the ocean. You have to amplify it every 50 kilometers or so. So they have a unit. And so if you a put booster a, a, a repeater or an optical amplifier, 
But you can imagine that if every 50 kilometers you included not only just amplifying the laser signal, but you had an accelerometer to measure vibration. You had a temperature gauge to measure the seafloor temperature. You had a pressure gauge that could not only measure variations in pressure due to climate change, but it could serve as your tsunami warning network. Okay? It's the same thing at the moment. It, you know, the buoy does it, but it has to sit on the surface of the ocean and gets knocked out. But the sensors on the bottom here, you would have fiber connecting all the sensors across the seafloor. And, and if you started doing this over 25 years or so, we'd cover the whole planet. And, and know it would a be lot a great more thing. about it. Exactly. So my involvement in climate change has been in part to try to work with the UN agencies and telecommunications companies to make the case that for some investment, which would probably have to involve the government, that we could put sensors on these cables and we could over time, slowly, really build up our knowledge base, not only about tsunamis, climate change, earthquake response. It would be a terrific, terrific benefit. One thing I always say about cables now, everybody loves the Internet. It connects the whole world. But those cables, they're, they're deaf, dumb, and blind. In other words, they go all the way across the ocean, and they know, don't know the least little bit of thing about what's going on. And so putting some sensors in makes a lot of sense. And in fact, if you look at any big project, big building, satellite, airplane, anything, it's filled with environmental sensors, how it's vibrating, what its temperature is, you know, other pressure variation. It's built into structures. But undersea cables don't build any of that stuff in. So it would seem to me that it's in their best interest to simply monitor some of this stuff because cables get broken by earthquakes, by motions of ships, they yank on the anchor. They don't know about this stuff till the stuff goes out. But if they had a few sensors in, they could begin to work in that fashion as well. So the good news is that the cable is an automatic communication. Yeah, uh, and so you get the power, you get the telemetry. Okay. It's on the seafloor. It's built to last 25 years. You don't years. have to build a separate system to yeah. convey that information. It, you know, these things cost a couple hundred million bucks. We're talking about an incremental cost of 5 or 10 percent. So rather than the government spending all that money, it can keep putting up satellites. Satellites cost a couple hundred million bucks, okay? And the, and the other thing is the, you know, the governments operate all the monitoring networks, basically. So whether it's uh, buoys or satellites or, or drones or balloons or whatever, seismic global network, all of it's basically supported by governments. But this is kind of unique because it's owned by the telecommunications industry. It's all private sector. So it's kind of an interesting trying to work with them so that we all find our common interest and can see this to be successful. Well, we, what it suggests to me is something that you've been alluding to, and it's this this global network thing, mm -hmm. and it's trying to understand Mother Earth. I mean, it's not just that there's a tsunami, but why? Right. And, and, and how can we predict the next time? How can we, how can we trace back on the step of, of causation, right. find out what led to that? And if you have all the sensors, all the seismological right. sensors, too, and, mm -hmm. and uh, on, on satellites and what have you, and if you get government and private industry to mm -hmm. all put them in the same basket somewhere, and you make this huge, big computer to read them all. I want it to be on your desk, by the way. I think it's only appropriate. <laughs> you can tell a lot about our planet. And, and going down that path, don't you think, Red, that somebody someday soon is going to have at least a fair shake, a fair uh, amount of that information, and will be able to tell how this planet is doing as a living, breathing organism? is scary in some ways. It sounds simple. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> on that note, we'll, we're going to, we're going <laughs> to, we're out of time. But, but it's just another clear indication we have to continue this discussion. Sure, more projects, pleasure. more science, pleasure. more lessons. <laughs> okay, that's Red Butler, and uh, he is the director of HIGP, the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology in Manoa. Uh, and we're talking about research of Manoa, big time. And we're talking about oh, well, global research, if you will, yeah. in the fullest sense of the word. Uh, and nothing, if you hadn't noticed, is simple. <laughs> Thank you so much. Pleasure, sir. <laughs>